right, guys, welcome back to the JPS podcast, Long Time No Speak. Jacob here, and we are reviving the podcast now that you all are in dire need of more content with lockdowns occurring around the world due to COVID-19. And I thought, what better way to kick things back off than to get my very first guest, for the podcast, Eric Helms, back on the show, and we are going to be talking about training during lockdown, what this means from a perspective standpoint, and how you can adjust your mindset, expectations, training program, as well as what you can be doing to ensure that you're getting the most out of your home workout training uh, during this unprecedented time. So for those of you who are in need of some home workout training programs, we have a free downloadable template which you can get through the link in my bio. But apart from that, I hope everybody is safe, doing well, and get ready for plenty more content from JPS uh, over the coming months. If you haven't already, check out our online mentorship course. There's no better time than the present to isolate and upskill. We've also just released the Powerlifting Fundamentals course, which is a 30 plus hour course covering the nuts and bolts and everything else in between of powerlifting and how to coach powerlifters to help them reach their strength potential. So if you're somebody who's interested in training strength athletes uh, and working with powerlifters, I highly recommend that you check that out. Without further ado, I introduce to you, Eric Helms. All right, Eric, welcome back to the podcast, man. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And I suspect I'll be wearing hats for most of my podcasts as my hair gets further and further out of control while I cannot get a haircut on lockdown. Yeah, yeah. Well, funnily enough, in Australia, uh, when we went to stage three, haircuts were allowed, but only for 30 minutes. Go for it. Yeah. Go well, pretty you. soon it's going to take longer than 30 minutes to fix this rat's <laughs> nest I got under this hat. So <laughs> I thought you were going to say that you were losing your hair, which is why you're wearing a hat, which is, I think, the reason I'll start wearing hats more and more. I wish that was the case, brother, but I uh, actually I don't wish that was the case. No, but, you don't at all. But no, I've got just a sufficient level of male pattern balding, but <laughs> no more. So. Perfect. Well, I hope that uh, gives people a little bit of an insight into where we're heading with this episode. Uh, Eric's obviously (laughs) uh, locked down, unable to get a haircut, and we're all experiencing uh, a very unique situation due to COVID-19, forcing gyms around the globe to close down. And whilst we often uh, think of our fitness as being uh, the pinnacle of importance in our lives, uh, times like this really demonstrates uh, that it's... uh, it is important to a degree in obviously tackling these health issues, uh, but it's not the be all and end all. And many people are now forced to work out at home and facing a number of challenges there. So do you want to outline, Eric, I guess, for every listener out there, what would be your your top tips in terms of managing the the mindset that comes with having to train at home? So now that we're training at home, we're obviously, for many people, unable to achieve our goals and keep working towards uh, you know, the goals that we had planned, whether it's a powerlifting meet, a bodybuilding show, uh, or just you know, getting as big and jacked as humanly possible. How do you navigate you know, course correcting your, uh, your goals per se and all the changes that come with training at home? Yeah, I I think probably the biggest one is this is an opportunity for a new perspective and a new relationship with with lifting or physical culture. I think, as uh, Omar Isaf might put it, this is the time that really tests you and you find out whether you're actually about that life, you know, or whether you need your pre-workout and your specific iso-inertial hammer strength uh, row with the banded attachment while your specific friend cheers you on that you can hear in the background while you're playing exactly the 32 second mark in your favorite song. Um, or are you happy to, to put, put a couple of uh, water jugs on, on two sturdy dining room chairs and do some dips? Um, not that specific example because dips and rows obviously don't do the same thing. No one's listening to me anymore now. <laughs> I've clearly exposed my ignorance. No, but I, I think it, on a very serious note, um, I think we, when we have luxuries and privilege and opportunities, we self-organize to what gives us the 
the best case scenario. You know, um, we chase optimal because that is something that we have the ability to get closer to uh, when we have access to all the amenities. But we can still chase optimal when we have limited choices. Um, and, you know, this is actually something that I grew to enjoy when I was traveling a lot in 2019, 2018, 2017, was having to be creative. You know, uh, I, uh, for example, in last year, April of 2019, I did a show and then I immediately went to Italy to present for uh, a conference. Um, and the hotel gym actually is in, the, is in the exact same scenario I'm in now. They had one very low quality barbell, uh, basically uh, a suite that they had just removed all the furniture from, which was the quote unquote gym, uh, and a, a barbell with 90 kilograms of total weight. And I had to figure out how do I get after it for a week. Um, and I was doing, and then they had no squat rack, they had a bench, um, but I was doing like front squat to high rep, uh, sorry, clean to high rep front squats, high rep RDLs, you know, trying not to throw up and, and getting creative. And I've had various uh, versions of that throughout my, my life once I started traveling. And it's made me be able to appreciate what I do have when I'm back home. And I've got my like five gym memberships or whatever in Auckland. <laughs> Um, but I think it also, it, um, it's given me more opportunities to have a more varied relationship with training. Mm. So I think the extroverts out there love going to the big gym, love hitting up their buddies on text messages, getting together and training. And I do have days where I really enjoy that. I love the old school mashups we used to do with 3DMJ. I love, uh, when we'd have team training sessions or when a friend, you know, comes out of town and trains with me or when I get to travel, but I've also really appreciated the, um, I guess, the mindfulness style focus of training alone um, and, you know, not having music and being able to just focus on the moment. And I think that's going to be an uncomfortable thing for people who are not uh, introverted and who don't have that kind of relationship with training. They don't really have an option. They have to develop that relationship. I mean, you could play some music on your iPhone or put your headphones in or whatever, um, but getting uncomfortable is the way that you expand the constraints of with, with, within which you can operate, which I think ultimately will benefit people. So I think that is probably the best way to frame this. It all comes down to framing. It is how do you look at this um, truly tragic situation globally? And I don't want to make, make light. Uh, you know, there are some people who are literally sick and their lives are at risk or have lost loved ones. And I'm saying, Hey, this is a great opportunity. I don't mean to, diminish that at all. But I am saying that for those who uh, want to stay engaged with their training, this is an opportunity to optimize the constraints of the situation. And when you really think about it, that's always what we're doing. We don't ever actually get to reach optimal. Uh, we don't ever actually get to know whether what we're doing is, is the best possible thing. Um, and so for example, right now, uh, I don't have access to a bench press. You know, I am simply, I simply cannot, I, I can do floor press with 90 kilos, you know? Um, does that mean I don't see myself as progressing in powerlifting? No, that's, that's not how I see it at all. You know, I'm doing handstand pushups. I'm doing floor press for high reps with 90 kilos. I'm doing feet elevated, uh, stretched, you know, hand elevated pushups. And more importantly, I, I'm fortunate to have 90 kilos of weight. That's more than my max snatch. So I'm doing technique work on the jerk. I'm focusing on my, my mobility work. I actually had a consultation with Dean Somerset and we talked about how to improve my, uh, my internal rotation, thoracic extension, and the things that help my overhead position. And that's good timing, you know? So I've got this timing to work on mobility and then I have a, a weight limit. So I can't let my ego get in the way of 90 kilos on a jerk, even though I've, I've jerked 115. So now I can actually ingrain new motor patterns and spend a month working on my jerk technique and actually still push my, my snatch up. It'll get a little awkward once I have to make the jump from 80 to 90, considering my max right now is like 82 or 83. But uh, I figure once I can do th triples at, at 80 for multiple sets, maybe I can try that single at 90. So I'm focusing on what can I improve uh, versus lamenting those things that I can't. Um, and that's a long preamble, but I think everyone can find that opportunity. Um, you know, if you can't effectively train legs and you're purely a bodybuilder right now, and you kind of just have to make do with, uh, you know, pretty good upper body training, which you can do at home, body weight, but nothing else. Think of it as a specialization cycle, mm. you know, 
we, we run those purposely sometimes when we're not in, in these conditions. So this is a great opportunity to work on, you know, you're, you're pushing and pulling with, with body weight and have it be a unique training stimulus for, for specializing on, on the upper body. And I don't even think it necessarily means that uh, you, you're going to make any substantial less progress than normal. Now, obviously, if you're, if you're a high-level power lifter and you didn't get access to, to, to weights on your own, are you going to be able to actually move that, that the needle from four, like a 220 kilo bench to 227 over the next two months? Probably not. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's all, it's all, all roses and, and, and sunshine, but I think for a lot of people out there, um, there, there are some pretty good opportunities. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit now about how people can adjust their expectations. So obviously that's a huge element of like shifting their mindset from, you know, what uh, can I do to what can I do? They have to obviously adopt that uh, solution focused mentality. But in saying that they also have to be realistic, which is, you know, the, when you bring in, realistic expectations to uh you know an optimistic can do attitude it kind of brings you back to that you know what are the limitations where are the constraints it's sort of you know you're putting the boundaries on things so what are the uh expectations people should have in terms of muscle muscle growth we'll talk about that first so you spoke about how people can still progress even doing body weight exercises and things like that um, do you define progression as improving their performance from day one of bodyweight exercises, or are you talking about progress in the sense of can they increase cross-sectional area of their muscles that they're training with bodyweight exercises over the next, say, you know, three to six months, however long we're going to be in lockdown? Yeah, I think um, hypertrophy is very easily the least, the, the, the least difficult of these goals to manage. It's the most forgiving, and I'm actually really comfortable uh, saying that uh, if you can do a host of bodyweight exercises, um, most muscle groups could actually improve at a similar rate as if you had free weight exercises. Um, to, to back up that statement with some empirical data, um, we have real good evidence to suggest that if you're training at a sufficient proximity to failure, which some data would suggest is more important when you're doing higher reps, which a lot of these bodyweight movements will be at least for uh, people who aren't you know, pretty, pretty heavy, um, is more important when you're doing higher reps. So that, that, that's something to consider is that you do need to push yourself. Um, and, you know, combining that with the monotony and the limited exercise selection and having to train very hard, I think sometimes the barriers to this progress that is potentially there that I'm very comfortable that one could make uh, empirically might be psychological. So this, this is actually going to be an opportunity to go, all right, I'm going to really get after it. I'm going to have a monotonous training routine of the same exercises. My only progression is going to be, for the most part, adding reps to body weight movements. Um, but uh, I know there's, there's, a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. This is going to be however long it is, like you said, maybe two to three months. Um, and if I can you know, really invest that effort now, I can actually see true hypertrophy. I mean, I do mean improvements in cross-sectional area, not just maintenance. So for example, uh, we've got uh, Lassavicius et al. in 2018 uh, showed that even at 40% of 1RM, uh, you can make similar hypertrophy to 60 and 80% of 1RM, so long as you're actually doing sets uh, to failure. Uh, Schoenfeld showed the same thing, comparing 8 to 12 RM to uh, 25 to 35 RM training, I think, in 2016. Um, and then we've also got a study by, I want to say, K Kikuchi and colleagues, where they compared um, push-ups to 40% 1RM on bench press, and also seeing similar outcomes in terms of hypertrophy. So we know that high reps work, and the muscles don't actually know whether you're holding the barbell or whether you're just upside down pushing up the earth, right? Um, and I think that that's a solid rationale to say, all right, well, if, if I can figure out some way to exert force and create tension in a given muscle group, so I'm hitting failure somewhere before I hit that 40 rep mark or so, yeah. um, and I do multiple sets of that, that's going to be an equivalent stimulus to if I was actually hitting up those hammer strength dice or inertial rows. Yeah. And if I'm, you know, if I can get the nutritional access to the sufficient protein and I'm eating enough calories, um, that could actually result in progress. There's going to be some muscle groups that are, that are, that are, that are a challenge to hit. Um, you know, even in some of the videos I put up on my Instagram and, and some of the stuff I did with Omar to talk about this and show it, I still did had, I used to blood flow restriction bands. I had a hip circle. Um, you know, if I didn't have the BFR bands around my, my hips, 
And if I didn't have the hip circle around my knees and I was doing just body weight hip thrusts, even really focusing on the squeeze and contraction, I would get cardiovascularly tired before I hit failure. You know, that'd probably be 40, 50 reps, but push-ups, handstand push-ups, table rows, um, you know, pull-ups, if you have a pull-up bar or, or a door frame, not a door that you can use, Yeah, you know, you, you can make some pretty good progress. Yeah. So, so there's a couple of important things you brought up there because I, I feel like a lot of people have taken the high rep training to mean any kind of rep range above what they would normally do and they can still make gains, which technically could be true, but I think you brought up a couple of good things there um, in wanting to keep your reps, say less than 40 and the you know, potential uh, you know, impairments of the, the stimulus uh, from like cardiometabolic fatigue or uh, just your aerobic capacity, limiting your ability to get that uh, peripheral or localized muscle fatigue. So how can people obviously with resistance keep their reps below say 40 weight and making exercise more difficult is one way. What are some other ways that people can uh, make the, the movements more challenging uh, to reduce their rep count from, you know, 40 or above? Yeah, well, first, I, I want to say that I think, I think I, I've said a lot of times, like some people could do more reps than 40, but it's also important to like, remember who I'm speaking to. Mm. I'm thinking uh, from the perspective of a guy who spent four years in the military doing push-ups and also yeah. has a more than a 1.5 times body weight bench. That realistically, even though there's plenty of folks out there, they're probably, especially listening to the JPS podcast or 3DMJ or me, that represents maybe even a minority of bodybuilders. You know, I think most people probably can't get yeah. 40 push-ups in a row. Many, many can't, don't get me wrong. And you're probably listening going, yes, I can. I'm not, I'm not saying you can't, person who's saying in your head you can. I'm saying that probably three quarters of people listening to this podcast can't. So they don't even need to worry about that. I think um, we often think about Oh, like the highest level bodybuilders, but that's not most people. But anyway, there's a lot of things you can do to make these more difficult. So for example, let's just start with push-ups as a basic example. Let's say you can crank out 60 push-ups in a row. Um, have you ever tried elevating your feet, slight incline? That'll drop about 10% off. Have you ever tried elevating both hands? Get two solid books, put them against links so they don't slide out. Now you can get a little deeper, get more stretch on the pecs, increase your range of motion. That'll drop another 10 reps off for most people. Um, also, just because you've got 40 reps to do, don't treat them like, eh, got to do 40 reps. Make each one intentional. Uh, you know, don't, don't like slow yourself down purposefully, but, but do the, the, the full eccentric, yeah. fully extend, lock your elbows out and, and, and repeat those reps. Be intentional in that process. Uh, make sure you're not using the, the inertia and momentum you can create uh, and, 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 you know, really, really try to create that maximal tension stimulus. Don't overslow it down. Don't do a bunch of additional pauses, uh, but definitely uh, control the movement, elevate your feet, elevate your hands. And all of a sudden, even someone who can do 70 push-ups is probably going to be getting close to that, that, that upper end range, but maybe you don't want to do 40 push-ups. And you you know, let's say you're, you're listening to this, you can bench 160, you can knock out 70 push-ups and I've gotten you down to 40 with those. Well, shit, widen your, your feet, put one hand behind your back, do single arm push-ups. I'd be impressed if you can get 20. There's very few people who can do 20 single arm push-ups, you know? Yeah. Um, there was a video of this. This is really impressive. Johnny Candido. Yeah. He had two chairs that were, that were uh, together. I with, saw yeah, that. I think, yeah. And he, it's really, I was impressed. Yeah. He had like the 10 kilo plate sitting across it. He crawled yeah. underneath them, pushed his back up against the, the hole, the middle of the plate, and then pushed the two chairs away and started doing weighted push-ups. Um, obviously if you've got, you know, family around or, or anyone in isolation with you, <laughs> you don't necessarily need the chair trick, but that's just goes to show you, um, yeah. you know, there's a backpack. If you've got a backpack lying around, fill that up and then you could do pushups as well. I mean, if you were, I mean, unless like Julius Maddox is listening and he's, you know, he's like, yeah, I'm already doing 40 reps on single arm pushups with a backpack full of 30 kilos. And I'm like, well, you might be only benching in the low 700s after this, uh, after this <laughs> quarantine, my friend. But, um, but I think for, for most people that that's an example of, of being able to make those mm. plenty hard. Yeah. Um, you know, body weight rows, inverted rows, most people, I've never seen anyone do more than 20 reps on those. Those are actually pretty difficult. Um, you know, same thing. If you have the opportunity to do chins, 
there are definitely some people, but strict chin-ups more than 20 reps, that's rare, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think, I think the upper body is a relatively easy answer. The problem is, is often with the lower body movements, you know? Um, like I, 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 sissy squats are a great option, but if you do have kind of janky knees, those probably are uncomfortable. Um, then another option is pistol squats, but pistol squats require a fair amount of mobility. Um, what you can just do is, is pistol squats onto a box. Uh, you can elevate your heel, uh, and you can control the range of motion there. And that's, that becomes pretty difficult, especially if you do it in proper form. So that's going to be, you know, a pretty effective stimulus for your, for your quads and glutes, uh, Nordic hamstring curls. Uh, those are great. That's an eccentric overload. So you will be sore the first couple of times. So I think that, that right there, those two movements are covering, you know, your glutes, your quads, your hands. Um, once you do those, you can also do like single leg glute bridges. Um, and you know, if you've got sufficient fatigue, you know, now, now you've got basically your lower body covered. Calves are very easy, you know, single leg calf raises. Um, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about it a lot. Like the, the erectors are, are a difficult one, mm. but if you have a long table, you can lay lengthwise with the table, hold on to it, put some and towels just, down, and yeah. you can do reverse hypers. Yeah. You know, um, you could do hyper extensions, but your upper body weighs more, so you'd need someone to actually hold your feet. So um, you can do like reverse a, hypers a side of a couch. I you could. About that. I, I think you did. You put up a post about that. I think last I, week. I I mentioned it mentioned somewhere. It I somewhere. think yeah. I um, think I wrote it down in one of the posts, or I uh, said it in a video. Yeah, but if you if you're at an angle on the couch, yeah, mucking around on the couch uh, the other day, and I thought, oh, could, this could work. But again, it's like it depends on the height of your couch. It depends on how like hard the couch is. Like some of those like couches have really nice. Um, what mm -hmm. is it like an arm? And, like that's like almost perfect. And if it's the right height, you you literally just get someone to hold your feet and you can get in there and crank them out. Um, but if you've got like a more, you know, square, like squared off uh, couch that's lower, um, it's going to be pretty, pretty uncomfortable. And if you're taller, it's going to suck a little bit, but yeah, there's ways yeah. around it. You just got to be uh, creative and have a little bit of ingenuity, I guess. Yeah. And you guys have been doing some great stuff on your YouTube channel, just different uh, ways of, of, of training different movements, which I really liked. I think most people, um, I think in, in the quote unquote evidence-based community, a lot of us, we try to find out the perfect answer before mm -hmm. we actually get our hands dirty. because so we want to have that safety blanket of I'm being quote unquote, hashtag science off or whatever. <laughs> and this is just simply one of those times where that mentality will, will truly hold you back. Yeah. And what you really need to do is just go to the garage, go into your closet, open up the pantry, check out what luggage you got, see what's heavy, see if you got any old water bottles hanging around and then just scratch your head and really just try a bunch of random shit for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, because let's say you're in the scenario where you got janky knees and uh, sissy squats hurt and you also don't have great ankle mobility and you can't just figure out how to do a good pistol and they're really uncomfortable, but you've got a foam roller. All right, well you put a foam roller on a chair now you can do Bulgarians. Well, I can do 30 Bulgarians and that's really tiring. I got to switch legs. All right, well, I got a backpack. I'm going to fill that backpack with a bunch of crap, put it on front ways to get the right, uh, you know, balance because I've got long limbs and now I can do the Bulgarians and I can get, you know, 20 reps per leg. And all of a sudden you've got glutes and hams sort of, mm. sorry, glutes and quads sort of. So, but if you don't actually go through the process of trying to do that stuff, if you just listen to four podcasts with me and listen yeah. to my posts and read Greg Knuckles article, um, that's not something you're going to figure out until you actually get there, get out there. And get just your on that, I, um, I had a similar kind of um, experience because uh, obviously I had a few clients who were in isolation, but I had access to the gym. So I was still like, yeah, like I can write you these home workouts. And I'm going to like, you know, put my mind in that place. Um, but I, you know, kind of pulled myself up and I was like, no, 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 I've got to, I've got to go feel this out and see what this is like so that I can, uh, you know, have a little bit more empathy and be able to relate uh, to, to what this person is going through and put together a real program. Um, that, that I think will do the job and something that I realized as well, which listeners can take this for what it's worth, but is exercise order plays a massive role as well. So if mm -hmm. you have like an exercise that you can do a lot of reps in, as we were discussing before, you might want to bring the reps down. If you do that uh, after an exercise that you train that muscle group uh, with as well, um, you're going to obviously pre-exhaust that muscle group and your reps will be a lot less. So I found that really useful as well, but I wouldn't have learned that wouldn't have realized that if I didn't go out 
and just get my hands dirty, you know, in the backyard doing, I was doing Bulgarian split squats. Um, and then I started doing like sissy squats. I was like, Oh, Holy crap. Like I can barely get like 15 sissy squats, like after the Bulgarians. But if I have done the sissy squats first, I think I would have been able to get a few more. And I think there's a lot of utility in yeah, experimenting and being able to, you know, trial things before you put them on paper. Absolutely. I had a very similar experience. So, so I'm fortunate. I've got um, a barbell with 90 kilos of weights. I've got a BFR band, hip circle, and some bands. So I've got a lot. But the thing is, is I've actually chosen, and not just because I want to have empathy or be able to videotape it for, for content, but because it gives me a few more exercises that I really like and I find are effective. I've got two upper body sessions in my current, you know, like lockdown split that I've got. Uh, one of the upper body sessions, I go in the garage and I do floor presses with 90 kilos. Uh, I do military press. Um, I can do standing if I'm just in the right spot where the ceiling's high enough or I can just sit on something. Um, I do barbell rows um, and I do uh, flies with plates um, and I do, uh, and I do pullovers to a tricep extension. Uh, and then I do a reverse curl because I could, you know, if I do a straight bar curl with my arms, um, with the underhand grip, it, it gives me elbow tendonitis. So that, that, that's all very straightforward. That's just stuff we do in the gym anytime if we want to use free weights. But my other session, I don't use the barbell at all. My other session, I do up here in the apartment. And for example, um, I can, because of my background in the military and because I'm a decent venture, I can do 50 plus reps on, uh, on push-ups, and I can get around 40 for dips or 45 or so if I do them first. Mm -hmm. So instead, you know, if you look at my exercise order that I actually, I put it on my Instagram story, I started with handstand push-ups. Yeah. Now my overhead press is pretty crap and it's the first time I've ever done handstand push-ups. So the most I could get was four reps per set. And my first set, I got two. So it was so un uncomfortable and I got three, then I got four. So I did my handstand push-ups, then I did my chins, then I did push-ups then I did my rows and then I did dips and on my push-ups that I elevated my feet and I had my hands on plates. I think I got 16 or 20 reps. Yeah. I got 15 to 20. And then my last set of dips, I only got 12. Mm -hmm. So the, um, the exercise order is absolutely something you can do to manipulate. And I think that's just, it goes to show you, like I chose to do uh, TRX rows, chins on, on a door frame with, uh, with, with my Versa grips uh, push-ups. That was and... one of my favorite Eric Helms moments because I had no idea what the hell was going on. <laughs> I see this like this traction post. I'm like, what the fuck? What, what did he do? <laughs> like, what's, what's the big deal? <laughs> and that has been my favorite Helms moment of your entire career. You've done a lot of good things. <laughs> that was the best. Oh, I'm so glad that was the one. You know, if, if, if I'm not actually helping people train, I'm at least providing entertainment, <laughs> yes. yep. you know? So, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's just a that, that's a great example. You know, exercise order, getting like again, it's getting your hands dirty. You just don't really know those fine details until you've gone through it. Um, and I've actually I'm really enjoying my 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 setup right now. You know, my own example of creativity is that I have that uh, those two upper body workouts I described: one in the apartment, one in the garage, and then I've got my other uh, three workouts. I've got two Olympic lifting workouts. I've only got 90 kilos of weights. Basically one day I start with snatch. The other day I start with clean and jerk. And then I do the few supplementary lifts that don't require blocks of any type and that require no more than 90 kilos of weight. So I do uh, a snatch high pull, yeah. um, snatch grip high pull, you know, since my snatch is only around 82, I can do three, four, five reps with 90 kilos. That's really good. Um, I can do behind the next snatch grip uh, strict press. And then I can do, uh, you know, push press. Um, and like I said, I'm doing basically a progression on my snatch where I'm going 60 for three by three, 70 for two by two, for three by two, and then 80 for three by one. And then the other day, I'm just increasing the reps by one, dropping the load by 10 kilos as I progress and flipping it with clean and jerk and going up to 80 and up to 90 on the other, on the other days. So, you know, and then I've got these supplementary lifts. Now my lower body day, again, Got to get creative with what I have. Front squat to three sets of around 15 to 20 uh, with 90 kilos, which is, you know, it's cardiovascular conditioning, but it's still getting the job done. Uh, then I'm doing conventional deadlifts, uh, controlling the eccentric, and I've got bands over my feet. So it's 90 kilos at the bottom, probably around 120, 130 at the top. Yeah. So again, I did three by 10 and we'll just let the RPE rise. So it went from like six to seven to seven and a half. 
And this week I'll probably do 12s. Next week I'll probably do 15s as I get my conditioning gets better. And then I've got, um, you know, the hip thrust banded BFR. I've got uh, Nordic hamstring curls. And then I've got the single leg calf raises. So I'm like very confident that I'm going to come back and have a, 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 an objectively better snatch 1RM. I'm going to have better clean and jerk uh, form technique and mobility. Mm-hmm. I will, I mean, whatever level of progress I can make, I don't feel from a hypertrophy perspective, I'm being held back at all. It's not my preferred way of training, but I do feel that I can make progress. Um, and then I'm basically doing a, an investment in, in the musculature for, for the deadlift, you know, control the centrics conventional, but hopefully down the line will, will help my sumo out. But right now I'm focusing on weightlifting uh, and strongman more. So it's, it's a little more helpful. So I think it's, it's more of a question of, all right, going back to your original, uh, ask of me of, Hey, like, what are the, uh, how do we reframe our goals and how do we change our perspective and adjust our expectations? Um, if your goals are just super broad and like, I want to get bigger and stronger, uh, you might feel a little left out in the rain, but if your goals can become more nuanced, I want to work on my technique in this way. I want to work on my, my, my mobility in this way. I want to specialize on this muscle group, or I want to invest in this accessory exercise, or I want to specifically go through a specialization cycle on front squats because that's what I can do or whatever. Then all of a sudden you can actually make specific progress on a specific goal uh, that, that could be yeah. as close to optimal as you might otherwise be in any other scenario, depending on the equipment you have available to you. Yeah, I think that's uh, really important for getting a little bit more purpose about your training as opposed to having those very broad goals. That's a really good point. And I guess for a lot of people, what they don't realize is that like for you, uh, you know, working on your mobility and your technique, whilst that doesn't um, directly and immediately improve your developments on your Olympic lifts, it has a delayed and like a transfer to that goal down the, down the line. Um, and I think because we always have access to a gym and the ability to train directly and specifically for whatever goals we have in the immediate uh, or short term, uh, we, we do so. And we often neglect all of the other things that can contribute um, to, our, to our goals. And I think for powerlifters, this is a great, great opportunity to you know, clean up any niggles and injuries, work mm-hmm. on mobility, um, you know, get rid of uh, any aches and pains and work on other fitness qualities that will have some transfer down the track, whether it's aerobic capacity, whether it's you know, muscular endurance with some higher rep stuff. Um, you know, I think, uh, yeah, people, people often, uh, overlook those kind of benefits, uh, during these periods. So, um, I think that, uh, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, should people be looking at potentially including more cardio to improve their, you know, aerobic capacity. So when they go back and do their resistance training, you know, they're not gassing out anything above like, you know, 12 reps. Um, you know, is, is this the time do you think to also say, Hey, okay, well maybe I can't you know, train to build muscle the way I want to. I'm going to try, I'm going to use the tools that I have available to do my best, but I'm also going to include some other, you know, fitness qualities that um, might improve just my general health and, you know, make me a better human um, and let me live a little bit longer. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And you may just need to do cardio because your overall activity has dropped off. Like I've got a, um, I've got a client I'm working with in Italy right now and they're on pretty serious lockdown. So he leaves the house to mail things. Um, he leaves the house to get groceries and he's got a home gym besides that. And all of a sudden we started to notice that his body weight was ticking up faster than it proportionally would have with the calories that he was on, uh, previously. And he was like, Hey, should I cut my calories back? And I was like, actually, no, you've got a rower. So let's do, let's do a low intensity session. Let's do one hit session per week. I'm normally not giving someone adding two cardio sessions in the middle of a bulking phase. That's not the standard approach, you know, like, (laughs) um, but I'm actually pretty convinced because this is a pretty, pretty active dude. Normally he gets around, he walks a lot. He's, he's fidgety. He's got a high neat. Um, and I would not be surprised if this being cooped up in a house would actually drop his, his aerobic conditioning below what it would be from his yeah. normal daily activities of life. So absolutely. I think that this is a good opportunity. Um, man, I tell you what, like I have had, a lot of like, like I think the way you framed that, that my mobility work isn't having a direct impact on my increasing my snatch or clean work right now, but it is an investment. Um, and I think 
when we have access to doing something that gives us an immediate, uh, you know, rush of endorphins and an immediate uh, potential way for us to see the return on investment, you know, like I'm doing curls right now, that's going to make my biceps yeah. bigger. I get a pump, uh, but I get this elbow tendonitis, whatever. I'm just going to, you know, adjust, adjust my grip position or whatever. But if, <clears throat> but if we can actually, if we're forced to do the things that are true investments, uh, this can end up paying off in the long run. So for example, you know, I've been meditating daily. I've been reading books that I've been meaning to finish for ages. Um, I have been taking walks with my wife. I've been cooking. Um, our overall diet quality has improved because they're, we're never going out to eat because no restaurants are open, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is a great opportunity to set up habits that maybe you actually want to take with you from lockdown into the future that might give you an extra one or 2% on your goals down the line. This is an opportunity to, to read some of the great literature out here to better understand the systems for hypertrophy, strength development, athleticism, your training as a trainer, your career or whatever, so that once you're out of lockdown, you can be better uh, or that things become more automated so that you can give more effort and attention to the things once that opportunity is back. So I think that that's probably the best way to frame it is that now you can invest in the things that you'd always be like, ah, stuff that I'll put that off, Yeah, you know? Um, so that, that's a great perspective, Jacob. And I, and I think that's almost the curse of um, the luxury of optimality, pulling things full circle back to some of your original uh, statements at the start of the podcast. Uh, yeah, the, the drawback of having the ability to optimize everything, um, you know, just by living in the 21st century uh, is that we don't uh, have to pay as much attention to a lot of the, the smaller details that can kind of j just get pushed aside and we push them aside and they just, they stay there for a long time. So yeah, something I've definitely been focusing on with myself and my clients and athletes is that this might be a period of taking one step back, but hopefully it allows us to take uh, two steps forward when uh, everything settles. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, a couple more uh, questions before we uh, round this one out. Uh, so progressing over the course of the next however long um, in terms of the, the stimulus or whatever we're doing to um, you know, make things or to make training better because we're getting better at whatever we're doing. Uh, how would you go about that uh, given that you know, for, for a lot of people, it's going to be pretty boring just like adding reps. Like, you know, the, I think that's the, the most challenging part is not can we progress things like from a physiological perspective or from the stimulus, but like people are going to get pretty, pretty bored of just doing more reps, especially if this drags out for longer than three months, I dare say. So what are your uh, suggestions for people uh, over the course of the next however long to progress their training to make it harder with these home workouts. Yeah, I think um, that that is going to be the challenge is that when there are fewer, like, like I, I've kind of liked, I have less constraints. It's easier to program, right? I like it. I don't have to choose between 60 different row variations. Yeah. I've got inverted rows and I've got barbell rows period, <laughs> you know? So, so, and, and I've got up to 90 kilos of weight, so I can try to get to maybe 20 reps on 90 kilos and barbell rows, you know, like I'm doing eight to 10 right now. So I've got plenty of runway there. Um, and then TRX rows, I'm getting like 10 to 12. So I've got a lot of runway there, but in four weeks, how excited am I going to be to do my 18th rep on inverted rows? Um, and I think that, that, that that's a great question. So then you have to think about, well, what are some of these ways that I could add load to myself? Uh, what are some of the ways that I can creatively get there? Um, one of the things we suggested in mass that's coming out just, uh, I think tomorrow, um, is pick a total rep target. That would be a big challenge for you to get over three to four sets. So for example, um, let's say you're someone who can do 30 reps. Uh, if, if you go full out on a set of pushups, you can gamify this a little bit and you can go, all right, how do I get to, to a hundred reps? With, with giving me four sets, right? And you think about how to pace yourself, how to get it in, you're pushing yourself. You have a given target. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you, you've gamified this a little bit. It's not just max reps, max reps, max reps, max reps. Now it's like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to an eight RPE on my first set. And then I'm gonna go to an eight and a half on my next, the most hold shy of failure, make sure I'm resting long enough because I wanna try to get a hundred over four sets. And then once you hit a hundred, all right, 
Now you kick it up 10% or 20%. You got to go for 110 or 120, 125 mm -hmm. reps. Then you give yourself some reasonable top end. So we're, if we're doing push-ups and we decided that more than 40 reps is pretty much like I'd rather shoot myself, then okay, once you're doing say 150 reps over four sets, all right, now it's time to elevate my feet, then it's time to elevate my hands, and then eventually it's time to go to single arm. So you have to learn what are some of the few progressions, gamify it, create a progression strategy. Um, you can definitely start. If you're someone who's just motivated by progress and you just like to see getting more reps and then that's good to go, then yeah, just add reps for forever until you know, you're hitting 50 plus. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're someone who does get uh, bored by this, gamifying, it's great. I mean, it's worked for endurance athletes for forever. You know, like endurance athletes, they are a unique breed, but even people who are like getting these different, you know, bikes and things like that, just having a course, having changes in grades, uh, having like a time to beat um, or, or certain strategies like that can make a big difference. So I would say having some type of uh, objective rep target over a given number of sets that once you reach it, it goes up a certain amount and you have basically self-created rules. And then once you reach that, you go to the next progression. That's a fantastic way to do it. Um, so I would say gamify, uh, utilize progressions, and then have some type of system. Those would be my three pieces of advice. Um, and you know, in the, in the meantime, you can also see, can you source some dumbbells? Can you source some bands? Who is shipping in your area? Uh, do you have access to any of these things? Is there some way you can get a delivery? Uh, without breaking any of the rules for lockdown or quarantine. Yeah. Um, so for example, before I realized that I could do pull-ups on the, uh, the, our, our actual door frame, not door on, on our patio, that's metal and reinforced. Um, I, I looked around and I actually found someone who would ship a pull-up bar, um, one of those tension rod ones. So there may be some floating video around of the tension breaking and me dropping out of the camera in the future. Um, which will be funny for everyone, but that's an example. In the meantime, I'm going to be doing what I can, but I've got, I've got a pull-up bar on the way. And that can actually be exciting. Just knowing like, Hey man, I've got these adjustable dumbbells that are coming. Like I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm, that'll motivate you just to keep doing the yeah. push-ups because you know, which, you know, you've got a little light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, Eric, I think that was very insightful as always. I hope the listeners take a lot out of that one. Thank you very much for your time. And guys, uh, you can find Eric uh, on Instagram, uh, Helms at 3DMJ. Uh, you're on YouTube. You've got the podcast with Omar. You've got Mass, uh, Team 3DMJ website. Anything that I'm missing? No, the 3DMuscleJourney.com is a great one-stop shop because you can find links to Mass, the pyramids, yeah. uh, our blog, our podcast, and then my, my Instagram and then Iron Culture. You got it. Perfect. So guys, make sure you check it out. Eric, we'll hopefully see you soon uh, in one piece and you haven't uh, pulled the house down or you know, fallen on barb or done anything like that. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime. Uh, but thank you very much, man. We'll chat to you soon. My pleasure. Thank you.